Greetings students and welcome back to another video on nonlinear dynamics. In this lesson we're going to get our pitchforks out and continue our lectures on bifurcations by discussing pitchfork bifurcations. There's actually two variants of pitchfork bifurcations. One of them is called the supercritical pitchfork and the other is called the subcritical pitchfork. We'll start the discussion by talking about supercritical pitchforks. Once we've done that, understanding subcritical pitchforks should come fairly naturally. Suppose we have a dynamical system of the form dx by dt equals mu x minus x cubed. What are the fixed points of this dynamical system? To answer this, we'll set dx by dt equals zero and solve for x. We'll begin with a simple factorization of xf and we'll end up with xf times mu minus xf squared on the left. From this factorization, it's quite clear that xf1 equals zero is always a fixed point, but depending on the value of mu, we could have some other fixed points as well. For instance, if mu were positive, then we could factorize this term in the parentheses further, which would result in two more fixed points at positive square root of mu and negative square root of mu. However, if mu were zero, then we would just have negative xf cubed equals zero, which only has one solution at xf equals zero. So when mu equals zero, we only have one fixed point at xf equals zero. And finally, if mu were negative, we wouldn't be able to factorize the term in the parentheses using real numbers, which means that zero would once again be the only solution. So in this solution, there's clearly something going on as we go from a negative mu to a zero mu to a positive mu. We're going from one fixed point at xf equals zero to three fixed points once we move to a positive mu. To get a better idea of what's going on, we'll perform some linear stability analysis of this dynamical system. We'll let f of x equal mu x minus x cubed, the right-hand side of our dynamical system. In linear stability analysis, we'll take the derivative of f of x with respect to x, and then evaluate that derivative at each of the fixed points we found. I discussed this in my video on linear stability analysis in this nonlinear dynamics series. If we evaluate df dx at the point of zero, we'll find that the stability of this fixed point depends on mu. If mu is positive, then this fixed point is unstable, but if mu is negative, then this fixed point is stable. Now, if mu equals zero, then our df by dx is just zero, but instead, xf1 isn't actually half stable, it's stable. This can be a point of confusion, so let me take some time to explain. So far, whenever we've gotten zero for df by dx in linear stability analysis, the fixed point has been half stable. In this situation, however, when mu equals zero, xf1 is weakly stable. The solutions to the differential equation do end up converging to xf1, but they don't converge that quickly. Now, weak stability isn't captured by linear stability analysis. We'd have to do a quadratic, cubic, or a higher order stability analysis to capture this weak stability. That's why we're getting zero even though the fixed point is stable. It's just weakly stable. So as a general rule, whenever you get zero during linear stability analysis of the derivative df dx, draw the face portrait of the situation you're dealing with because that gives you a better idea of what's happening, whether it's a half stable fixed point or a weakly stable or unstable fixed point. For instance, if you were to draw the face portrait of this differential equation when mu is zero, you would see that the fixed point at zero is actually weakly stable since the derivative is positive on the left, x tends to increase and the derivative is negative on the right, x tends to decrease. Therefore, xf equals zero is a stable fixed point when mu equals zero. So we've analyzed the stability of xf equals zero and how that depends on mu. Let's look at the stability of the two fixed points that are created when mu is positive, the positive and negative square root of mu. So when xf2 is positive square root of mu, df dx is negative two mu. And since mu has to be a positive number for this fixed point to occur, the fixed point xf2 must be stable because df dx is negative. The same applies to the third fixed point at negative square root of mu. Here df by dx you can see is also negative two mu, which means that xf3 is also stable. For the sake of completeness, I'll also draw the phase portrait when mu is negative, and the phase portrait when mu is positive. Let's now draw the bifurcation diagram showing all this behavior. For negative mu and for zero mu, we only have one stable fixed point at zero, so I'll use a solid line to denote the stable fixed point. For positive mu, the fixed point at zero becomes unstable, so I'm gonna use a dashed line over here, but two additional stable fixed points are created at positive and negative square root of mu. 
So we can see from our bifurcation diagram that as we go from a negative mu to a positive mu, our constant fixed point at zero switches its stability, and in the meantime, two stable fixed points are created. This is what defines a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation. The normal form of this bifurcation is the differential equation we just discussed, the dx by dt equals mu x minus x cubed. A dynamical system or differential equation that has a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation will look like dx by dt equals mu x minus x cubed near the area of the supercritical pitchfork bifurcation. Now it's called a pitchfork because of the shape of the bifurcation diagram. The curves on the diagram look like they're forming a literal pitchfork. Let's now move on to the subcritical pitchfork bifurcation. A subcritical pitchfork is very similar to a supercritical pitchfork. The main differences arise from the fact that the normal form now has a plus in front of the cubic term instead of a minus, which gives rise to some slightly different dynamics. We'll begin examining these dynamics by finding the fixed points. Set dx by dt equal to zero and solve for x, the usual procedure we've always been doing. We'll begin with a simple factorization of xf, and we'll end up with xf times mu plus xf squared on the left. From this factorization, it's quite clear that xf1 equals zero is always a fixed point, but depending on the value of mu, we could also have some other fixed points. For instance, if mu were negative, then we could factorize this term in the parentheses further, which would result in two more fixed points at square root of negative mu and the negative of square root of negative mu. However, if mu were zero, then we would just have xf cubed equals zero, which only has one solution at xf equal to zero. If mu were positive, we wouldn't be able to factorize the term in the parentheses using real numbers, which means that zero would once again be the only solution. So what's happening now is essentially the reverse of what happened with the supercritical pitchfork. As we go from a negative mu to zero mu to positive mu, we're going from three fixed points to one fixed point at xf equals zero. To get a better idea of what's going on, we'll once again perform some linear stability analysis of this dynamical system. We'll let g of x equal to mu x plus x cubed, take the derivative of g with respect to x, and evaluate that derivative at each of the fixed points we found. If we evaluate dg by dx at the fixed point of zero, we'll find that the stability of zero depends on mu. If mu is positive, then the fixed point is unstable. If mu is negative, then xf1 is stable. And if mu is zero, xf1 is weakly unstable. This weak instability again isn't quite captured by linear stability analysis, which is why even though dg by dx is zero at mu equals zero and xf1 equals zero, the fixed point is actually unstable. To illustrate this, I'll draw the phase portrait of this differential equation when mu is zero. From the phase portrait, you'll see that the fixed point at zero is actually weakly unstable. Since the derivative is positive on the right, that means x tends to increase, and the derivative is negative on the left, which means that x tends to decrease. Let's look at the stability of the two fixed points that are created when mu is negative, the positive and negative square root of negative mu. So when xf2 is positive square root of negative mu, dg by dx is negative two mu. But since mu has to be a negative number for this fixed point to occur, the fixed point xf2 must be unstable because negative of a negative number is positive. The same applies to the third fixed point at negative square root of negative mu. Here, dg by dx is also negative two mu, which means that xf3 is also unstable. Just like before, I'll draw the face portrait when mu is negative. and the face portrait when mu is positive. Let's now draw the bifurcation diagram showing all this behavior. For positive mu and for zero mu, we have only one unstable fixed point at zero. For negative mu, the fixed point at zero becomes stable, but two additional unstable fixed points are created at positive and negative square root of negative mu. So we can see from our bifurcation diagram that as we go from a negative mu to a positive mu, our constant fixed point at zero switches its stability, and in the meantime, two unstable fixed points vanish. This is what defines a subcritical pitchfork bifurcation. Compared to a supercritical pitchfork, the stabilities and the direction the pitchfork is facing are both inverted. And as mentioned earlier, the normal form of this bifurcation is dx by dt equals mu x plus x cubed. 
a dynamical system or differential equation that has a subcritical pitchfork bifurcation will look like the normal form near the area of the subcritical pitchfork bifurcation. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.